Hello everyone. So today we're looking at B1.2, which is proteins in IV biology. This topic will be easier and shorter than last week's. But before we get started, I want to remind everyone that we're doing a tutoring giveaway on our Instagram. So if you're interested, go to the description of this video where you can follow the link and follow the simple steps to enter. Good luck. Firstly, like last time, uh, here's a question that you might see. If you know how to answer this question, you might be good. Otherwise, I strongly encourage you to stick around. So let's start off by looking at the structure of amino acids. So amino acids are the monomer, the subunit that forms proteins. It's kind of like glucose to a polysaccharide, right? Uh, if we look at the structure, there's an alpha carbon in the middle, which is bound to four things. Remember, carbon combined covalently to four different things. A hydrogen, a side chain, which we will call R for the time being, an NH2, which is called an amine group, and then a COOH, which is called a carboxyl group. And you do need to remember how to draw this, I'm afraid. So uh, keep this in mind. So amino acids, um, let's talk about them in terms of our diet. So some of them are essential, some of them are non-essential. Uh, basically, there's 20 different amino acids that ribosomes use to make polypeptides. Plants can make all of these through photosynthesis, but animals obtain them from their food. However, uh, some amino acids, right, we can make from other amino acids, so they're non-essential. But some of them, you can't synthesize in sufficient quantities, so it must be obtained from diet. For example, lysine is an essential amino acid, whereas alanine is not. Nine out of 20 are essential, uh, and this is why it's important to keep a balanced diet. Uh, vegans, for example, need to pay special attention to this because plants can have different uh, balances of amino acids, so they need to watch out to make sure that all of the essential amino acids uh, are being met and are present in their diet. So now let's look at how polypeptides are actually made. Well, we start by joining two amino acids into a dipeptide. Uh, this is a condensation reaction, as some of you might have guessed, similar to carbohydrates, right, and lipids. Uh, and the bond that forms is called a peptide bond. So we'll get a bond between the C and the N with water being lost because it's a condensation reaction. The opposite can also happen, uh, and that's a hydrolysis reaction, as you'll probably know by now. Because the bond happens between the carboxyl and the amine group, the R group doesn't really matter in this reaction, right? So any two amino acids can bind to each other. Um, which is great because it generates a lot of diversity. So if we go on, join uh, two amino acids to form a dipeptide and then go on and go on, we'll form a polypeptide, right? Which can be of very distinct lengths. Basically, polypeptides, because the amino acids can be in any order, you get almost an infinite variety of possible chains. Um, so for example, if you have a polypeptide which is 400 amino acids, actually you can have 20 to the power of 400 possible sequences, right? Which is crazy. Uh, it's almost infinity. Um, here are four examples of polypeptides. You need to know some, not necessarily these. If you have a polypeptide that you prefer, then remember that by all means, but these are just some examples. Beta endorphin is a natural painkiller. It's 31 amino acids. Insulin is, uh, plays a role in blood glucose control. It's 51 amino acids. Alpha amylase uh, helps digest starch in the saliva, and it's 496 amino acids. And then titine uh, is the largest polypeptide that has been found. It's found in muscle, and it's 34,450 amino acids, which is absolutely bonkers. Great. So now the last thing for SL, and this will make a lot more sense when we cover HL. So for those in SL, if this is not clear, maybe look at the HL part because it will really clear it up and you don't need to remember it, so that's great. Uh, so we're looking at pH and temperature. What effect does that happen on proteins? Well, for the SL people, just know that polypeptides actually end up acquiring a 3D structure. That's not just the chain of amino acids, right? This 3D structure is held together by different bonds. When you break these bonds, that's called denaturation, right? And denaturation is permanent, and it can be basically, it can be caused by temperature, or by pH. So when temperatures are too high, denaturation happens. But when pH is very low or very high, it can also happen. Again, this will make more sense in a minute for the HL people. So moving on to HL. The first thing we're going to look at, this is super simple. You just need to know that amino acids are very, very diverse. So there's hydrophobic amino acids, there's hydrophilic amino acids. Within the hydrophilic amino acids, uh, there's basic and acidic and charged and non-charged amino acids. So just know that this is going to lead to a huge amount of diversity in the possible uh, proteins that we can get. So now let's look at the structure. And again, denatrition is going to make more sense after this. Basically, the protein structure has four levels of, com of complexity, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. 
Starting off with primary, primary is just the linear sequence of amino acids and polypeptides. So it's determined by which amino acids go in which order, but that's it, right? It's just a chain of amino acids. Um, but we'll see that actually proteins end up getting a 3D shape. And that's possible because these bonds over here, so the bonds between the alpha carbons and other atoms can rotate, right? And that rotation allows for almost any 3D shape. Um, to be possible. And it's actually the sequence of different amino acids and their R groups that's going to determine how a protein folds. This, uh, how it folds, we're not just studying it just because, right? It's very important because it determines their function. Uh, and again, proteins do almost everything, right? So their function is very important to understand and folding is related to that. So again, we said, and let's keep the sequence here clear because it's it makes it really easy to understand. So we have the primary structure, right? Just amino acid after amino acid. Then we can get a secondary structure. The secondary structure is caused by only one thing, hydrogen bonds between the CO and the NH. This is from the amine group and the carboxyl group, right? You can see it here. Uh, these are charged, they're polar, right? So they can hydrogen bond with each other. When this happens, uh, because so many hydrogen bonds form, it gives rise to quite a strong structure. So we can have either an alpha helix or a beta sheet. In the alpha helix, the hydrogen bonds are happening between adjacent turns, whereas here in the beta sheet, they're happening between the different sections of polypeptide, right, that are parallel to each other. So they're kind of wrapped around, um, so 180 degrees every once, uh, every now and then, giving it this structure uh, that you see here. Uh, but bear in mind, secondary structure, what you need to remember, hydrogen bonds between CO and NH, and these two different structures. Then we have tertiary structure. So tertiary structure is that plus uh, other interactions, right? Many, in this case, we have ionic bonds. So ionic bonds happen between R groups. So between positively and negatively charged R groups. Um, this can be influenced by pH because basically, uh, as I said, it's between charged groups, but these charged groups actually occur because of the pH. So hydrogen donation or reception. So amine groups, basically, to keep it simple, amine groups can become positively charged if they accept a proton. You can see here, right? It becomes NH3 plus instead of NH2. Whereas carboxyl groups can actually become negatively charged when they donate a proton. So when they donate their H over here. You can go back to the amino acid structure if this doesn't make sense. But basically, they can become charged and then bind to each other. But this is dependent on pH. And that's why pH at its extremes causes denaturation because it breaks these bonds. Hopefully that makes some sense. Again, leave some questions in the comments if you don't understand. We can also have hydrogen bonds, so even more. We can have disulfide bonds. This can only happen between cysteines. So cysteine is a type of amino acid and it can it has sulfur in it, right? So it's the only one uh, where it can happen. And this is the strongest interaction of all. Why? Because it's a covalent bond. And then finally, we can have hydrophobic interactions. This can happen between nonpolar our groups. Okay, I know this is a lot to understand, um, but hopefully it makes some sense. So the tertiary structure is going to be the first structure that's genuinely 3D. A lot of times uh, it looks like a ball, right? That's the easiest way to understand it, I think. Um, and sometimes, and this is when it gets messy, sometimes the tertiary structure will have some secondary structures within it, right? So it might have some alpha um, helixes or beta sheets within it. So the tertiary structure actually as I mentioned, a lot of times it looks like a ball, um, like a globular protein, right, it's called, and then sometimes it's an integral protein when it's in the membrane. These two have different characteristics. So something important to understand is how does the protein fold into this sort of ball, right, this globular form? Well, the hydrophobic amino acids, okay, important, the hydrophobic amino acids don't want to be close to water. So they normally try and cluster in the center where there's no water, right? Because remember, proteins are in a cell. So outside, they're completely surrounded by water. So the hydrophobic amino acids are going to try to hide in the middle. But in integral proteins, because they're touching the membrane here, right? This is not water. So actually, the hydrophobic amino acids will not be in the center, but rather will be on the surface here, right? So this is just to show that in different types of proteins, um, you can have hydrophobic amino acids in the center or on their surface, right? Depending on what's outside, water over here, right? And then hydrophobic amino acids will be here. Or if this is nonpolar, such as a phospholipid membrane, then you will have the hydrophobic amino acids here as well. Hopefully that's, that makes some sense. And then finally, we have the quaternary structure. 
So what is the quaternary structure? Because it seems like the tertiary is the final one, right? And it kind of is. But some proteins can actually consist of two or more polypeptides linked together. These are separate polypeptides, which then come together. Uh, and in this case, the 3D structure is called the quaternary structure. So it's basically different tertiary structures brought together, right? You can see here the different ones. And then within the quaternary structure, we have non-conjugated and conjugated proteins. So non-conjugated proteins is when you have more than one polypeptide, but that's it, right? And a good example is collagen. This is three different polypeptides wrapped around each other. But conjugated proteins have more than one uh, polype polypeptide, but then they also have a non-polypeptide subunit. So for example, in hemoglobin, you have four polypeptides, so four tertiary structures, and then you will, each of them has a heme group. Um, why would we have this? It's because basically having other stuff makes proteins more diverse. They can do more functions, right? Uh, heme, for example, binds oxygen. So it allows hemoglobin to carry oxygen in the blood, which it would not be able to do otherwise. And then another way of characterizing proteins. So until now, we've been looking at the different um, levels um, of structure. But then proteins, in the end, can be classified into fibrous or globular and this determines their function. So fibrous proteins are, collagen is again an example, uh, they're elongated polypeptides, right? They're normally structural, so they're fibers or filaments, right? They have high tensile strength and they're insoluble. So they're there to provide structure to your skin or tissues, right? Whereas globular proteins, right, have more of a rounded ball-like shape. Um, and these are normally more functional, so they're enzymes or they're receptors, right? And they're normally soluble because they need to be in the cytoplasm, in the water, dissolved, right? To actually be able to carry out these reactions. So that's a wrap to the content. So I'm, I really hope that makes sense. I understand that the structure is quite confusing. Let's do some questions. So tyrosine is an amino acid. Which section is unique to it? Again, pause to think, but three two, and one, this should be straightforward. It's A, right? Oops, sorry, I messed a D up before. Uh, so the COOH is the carboxyl group, that doesn't change. The NH2, same thing, the amine group. The alpha carbon here also does not change, but the R group over here does change, right? This is what changes in every single amino acid. Then the second question is, draw a labeled diagram of an amino acid. And again, uh, if you go back to slide number three, uh, you've got it there, right? But try and draw it by yourself. And three, two, and one. And here it is, right? I don't think there's much explanation needed. This is something you just need to memorize. Then explain how a globular protein ha can have different properties before and after denaturing. So this is the question I posed to you at the start. Let's see if now you would be able to answer it. Again, pause now. And three, two, and one. Okay, so... Normally, hydrophobic residues are in center of the protein, right? Because again, this is a globular protein, right? Remember, if it were integral, it would be different. But in a globular protein, the hydrophobic residues are in the center, so it will be soluble. But denaturation causes the hydrophobic residues to be exposed to the surface because, remember, it breaks those interactions, right? Um, it breaks the ionic bonds, for example, and this makes it insoluble. So that's a different a difference in properties, right? Soluble versus insoluble. I understand this question is actually quite tricky, so <clears throat> I wouldn't blame you if um, you had some trouble with it. And then finally, which of the following chemical groups does not bind to the alpha carbon directly? This should again be a piece of cake, especially if you drew it correctly. Um, and then three, two, and one. The OH, right? The OH is bound to, so in the COOH, the OH is bound to the C, but not to the alpha carbon, right? The only things that are bound to the alpha carbon are H, NH2, the COH, and the R group. Amazing. So that's the end of this topic. As I said, it's briefer than the last, which is good. Uh, and next week, we'll be back for the next topic. If you have any questions in the meantime, let me know.